All right. Welcome to IFMA NYC's on re or IFMA NYC's presentation on reset standards. This is part one of a two-part webinar series on reset standard, an introduction to understanding the indoor air quality metric that green building certifications are pointing to as a benchmark. Note, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel later, later this week. Please feel free to submit any questions you have into the chat box. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. I am pleased to introduce Jessica Bogdan, who will be moderating today. Jessica is a business development manager for All Steel and the chair of IFMA NYC's sustainability committee. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, please uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, sponsors. They are very important to us. So there you go. And then let me introduce to you our panel. We have a terrific panel today. So uh, Anjanette Green is the Director of Standards Development and co-author of the Reset Standards. Dr. Christine Bruckner is a director and an architect at M. Moser. George Moroshnikov is a Senior Sustainability Analyst at Siska Hennessy Group. And Stanton Wong, who will be joining us very soon, he is the president of Reset. Um, and he is going to be fielding the Q&A portion of our webinar, which will be occurring in the last 10 minutes of our um, event here. Uh, so please make sure that you put in a Q&A um, chat, in, I'm sorry, your questions into the chat, uh, and we'll be taking a look at that and making sure that we answer that in the last 10 minutes, okay? So, Anjanette, what is Reset? <laughs> Well, first of all, thanks everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here to talk about exactly that. What is Reset? And just as a reminder, we're gonna cover a lot of ground. So my email is on the slide that you'll see, as well as please go to the website to reach out to anybody on the Reset team. We're always happy to hear from you and we'd like to hear about your projects. Um, so let's just jump right in. What is the Reset standard? Well, the Reset Standard is the world's first international performance standard and certification program that tracks the health performance of buildings in real time using continuous monitoring data. And because it's both a standard and a certification program, you'll see on this next slide that Reset's been adopted by plenty of other green building programs, many that you're familiar with. And we've created crosswalks with them to recognize Reset as a compliance pathway. So I think this really speaks to the strength of the standard. Not only is it something that you can use towards certification itself, but it can help you with these other certification and credits as well. So there's three comprehensive parts to a data quality program. And it might not be uh, news to a lot of people that 2020 was a pretty uh, in intense year. And I think that there's um, a little knowledge about the fact that there's very few standards out there when it comes to data and data quality. Now, after such a turbulent year, I cannot stress the importance enough of having standards for data and quality on every level in our modern world. So the reset standards offer three really important levels of data evaluation. It's a production standard, meaning does the data come from authoritative sources? It's a reporting standard, meaning how does that data get aggregated? Does it have uniformity or baseline criteria? And it's a project assessment tool. So how is that data being communicated? Is it easily understood? And can it be interpreted by many users and many people? Now, the reset standard has several modules. We've got a materials module, the air module, energy, water, circularity. Some of these are in pilot stage, but the air quality module is the one we're most known for. And that's the one, of course, that we're going to be talking about today. Now, it's also worth mentioning that there are different statuses in the reset certification process, everything from an entry level certification to reset full certification. Now, we just presented a webinar on this, so we'd like you to uh, join that. It's a recorded session that you can join at any time. But I think it's really worth noting that each of these different stages represent projects as they move towards certification, but they're all noteworthy in their own right. So let's talk a little bit about the approach and the philosophy of reset. There's a lot to read on this slide, but I think it's really important to bullet out the core tenets of our program. It is a non-prescriptive standard. 
Our aim has always been to allow project teams to come up with solutions that are unique to their own projects and their own scenarios. So we really don't want to police projects with a checklist. We really want to give teams the latitude to explore pathways that achieve their end goals. And this philosophy is really a strength of the reset accreditation process with our APs and our auditors, because they're the ones that are helping us uh, helping with deployment plans and calculations and ensuring that the projects are both collaborative and inclusive efforts. So we can survive for weeks without food, days without water, but only a few minutes without air. And so really health for us begins with air. And there are parameters that are required to be monitored by the reset standard. And we're gonna go through all of those now. So PM 2.5, TVOC, CO2, temperature, and humidity. Now PM, particulate matter. I think most of the, us that are on this call, or at least hopefully most of us, are familiar with the dangers that surround particulate matter. It has been a pollutant of concern for a long time, and there is a wide body of evidence that points to harmful human effects as a result from exposure to particulate matter. But what exactly are we talking about when we're saying particulate matter in indoor spaces? This slide is one of my favorites. It's a slide that on the left, it's just basically a sample of indoor dust and it's just black and white. It's just the particulate that we found in an indoor space under a microscope. Now on the right hand side of that, it's the same sample where a dye was added that could color anything that was synthetic. And so really what this is demonstrating is that in our modern world, indoor particulate is really synthetic. It's largely made up of everything in our space that's decomposing over time. And when you mix this with outdoor air pollution, this is a real problematic situation that I don't think most people are aware of. Now, when you fold on top of that, the latest studies that we've seen from Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health that's showing for every one microgram per cubic meter increase in PM2.5 exposure, there's an 8% chance of mortality, an increase in that rate from COVID-19, this is a parameter that just continues to gain more strength and reasons to why we should be monitoring it and why it's so important for us to understand its impact on human health. So moving to TVOCs, this is volatile organic compounds. And this is typically off-gassing that's coming from materials that are in, in indoor spaces. Now, what we typically see is whether they're pursuing a certification program or not, most projects will conduct what's called a flush out phase. And they'll do that right after construction. But the problem with this, this, this approach is really flawed because it doesn't address what happens when people move into a space, close up the building, and then they are aware of these buildups of VOCs that happen over time. Now, in this next slide, we actually tested a space at the request of a client over the course of about seven days. And you can see these signature peaks and valleys that occur, and that usually is trending with the HVAC system. The valleys are when the HVAC is on and it's able to actually remove those VOCs. And the peaks are when the HVAC is off and the TVOC levels are just building up over time. So you can see in this example that just over the course of a couple of days, the system can't keep up and those TVOCs just keep building up and building up until they're very quickly at a point of hazard and unsafe levels. So the next one to watch is CO2. Now, I think CO2, we've always learned that this is sort of the proxy gas. We use this to tell us if we need to ventilate or not. But there's some real provocative studies and research that's come out. Now, if you haven't heard of the COG Funk uh, study that was published in 2015, again, Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health in compilation with SUNY and Sierra Cruz, this was a study that they were testing what were called green buildings, enhanced green buildings, and conventional offices. And on average, cognitive scores from the occupants were 61% higher on green building days and 101% higher on these green enhanced building days as compared to a conventional building day. So what's really compelling about this is not only is CO2 a proxy gas, but it's pointing to our ability to function and think in a space productively. Now we'll talk about CO2 a little bit more as a proxy when it comes to the reset index when we're estimating infection potential as well. So that brings me to temperature and humidity. Now these are required to be monitored, but reset doesn't have specific thresholds for these. However, 
it's mandatory that you monitor these because both of these parameters play a really important role in understanding other pollutants. For example, high humidity can often increase your TVOCs. So it's really helpful to see these trends in order to understand what might be contributing to an overall air quality issue. Now, spending just a moment more on temperature and humidity, it's important because in this current pandemic situation, temperature and humidity have been getting a lot of press, a lot of attention around this. And there's a lot of studies explaining why. Dry air can negatively impact our human health, everything from dry vocal cords to eye irritation. In fact, low humidity has the potential to weaken the body's innate immune system. And this makes us more susceptible to infection. Now there's been a lot of studies on aerosols. I'm sure that any of you who have been on these calls as of late through the past uh, year, we've talked a lot about airborne viruses, and aerosols and droplets. So it's really critical that we understand this research and we continue to learn about how temperature and humidity influence droplet size because this affects those aerosols which can remain airborne for long periods of time and potentially be, in be inhaled by occupants. So this is a good time to show you the slide with all of the different performance targets for RESET. You'll see that we have both PM2.5, TVOC, CO2, temperature, and humidity. Now, as far as the index is concerned, we know that we're not able to monitor viruses in real time, but it is possible to monitor air quality parameters that potentially contribute to that viral infection potential. So when we look at temperature, humidity, PM2.5, and CO2, this is where we can monitor in the building and apply it to the index. So what the RESET team did is over the course of a nine month long period, we were looking at the scientific data and the literature that we had to date. And we translated that in order to map it to sensor data that was applicable to the built environment. Now, this is different than some of the different predictive models that you see out there that are using things such as a proxy of how many people in a space only to predict how long you can be in a space. What's different about our model is that it's actually using a proactive approach using the controls of the building. So from the research and from applying it, we were able to come up with a representative score that could be easily understood in real time. Now, of course, there are far more factors that play a role in whether or not you become ill or infected. But again, we're focusing our, our efforts on specific parameters that can be measured with continuous monitors and then controlled by the environment. So temperature, humidity, we have sensors that can actually reliably look at that. Temperature, humidity, and PM, PM 2.5, we have monitors and we can apply that to the immune system data and so on and so forth, so that we can crunch these numbers to actually arrive at something really interesting, what we call the reset index. And on this next slide, you can see that we're taking the fundamental sensor data, real-time data, and average data, and we're crunching that into three separate numbers, a percent that tells you the optimal health for your building, an infection potential, as well as a certainty. Now, having complete transparency on how these numbers are arrived at, I think is really key as there's a lot of conflicting evidence on the market right now. Now, as soon as we get more and more data, that certainty percentage is just gonna get more and more acute. So we're hoping that we will continue to rise um, to that occasion and we'll get continued input from all of the experts such as yourselves on the call today. So let's talk about monitoring and how do we decouple indoor and outdoor air quality data? Okay, so air quality basics. There are two approaches to air quality monitoring. First, there's the indoor air monitoring. And then secondly, it's the HVAC system or the air that's being delivered to the occupants. So first, indoor air. This is probably the one you're most familiar with. Monitors are placed in interior spaces and the data gives us insights on pollutants that are usually caused by human behaviors like particulate matter from secondhand smoke or even vacuuming, VOCs released from cleaning products or materials. Now to deploy these standards, RESET codifies how they should be installed. They must be placed within the breathing zone and away from operable windows and air supply sources. Now, the second part, outdoor monitoring, is a little bit different. 
Outdoor monitoring requires two things. You need to have outdoor air quality monitors in place so you can set a baseline. And then you have induct monitors that are placed after filtration, but in the duct system so that a direct comparison can be derived. And then this performance um, can then determine if your HVAC, HVAC system is doing what it should, filtering the air, mixing it properly, and delivering great air to your occupants. And so what RESET really does when you deploy these two approaches is it enables you to decouple the data that's coming from indoor air from the building itself. And this can reduce a lot of finger pointing from the two entities involved, but it can also help you identify sources that could be causing air quality problems and more importantly, help you remediate it. All right, so a quick word about monitoring the continuous monitoring approach. I think this slide is great because it really helps people sort out what is continuous monitoring versus spot tests or lab tests. Think of continuous monitoring as trending over time. Continuous monitoring is like a video camera. It's taking these ongoing images where a lab test is like a high definition camera. Now, while a high definition camera is going to take extremely precise pictures, it's limited in that it's just a moment in time. Now, a video camera, on the other hand, is trending over time and it's giving you historical data. And this is critical because project spaces and air quality continue uh, to change all the time, minute by minute, hour by hour. So this next slide are a few examples of some of these lab test methods and direct read methods. Some of these you might be familiar with that are referenced as the US EPA's compendium method. And these are canister tests, quite different than the next slide, which is showing you what trending data looks like. Now, this is historical data. And this is one of our dashboards as examples. If you were to take a spot test, now, depending on where you took that sample, your results are either gonna be really good or they're gonna be really bad. So it's important to stress that IQ testing is complex and all methods have a place in a complete assessment, but it's really our responsibility to understand the pros and cons so that we can deploy the correct test and the correct methodology for our particular buildings. Now, RESET also has a transparent testing methodology for monitors, and this is a real critical part to the standard. Reset classifies monitors using a graded system, A, B, and C. A grade A monitor would be like a federal reference device. A grade B is a third party accredited device and grade C is our consumer grade. Now there's a place again in the market for all of these, but only grades A and B are allowed on reset projects. And here's a few examples, just so you can familiarize yourself. An indoor monitor, you can see there on the left, an induct monitor in the middle and an outdoor device on the far side. So here's a couple examples of installation, an indoor, either wall-mounted um, and plugged directly into a socket or hardwired, an in-duct monitor, so a duct probe or a tube that's going into a duct might be something less familiar. And then lastly, outdoor monitors. Now, it's important to understand fit for purpose when you're talking to your clients or you're thinking about a deployment plan, because obviously there's going to be a price change depending on what monitor, but these outdoor devices are very specialized pieces of equipment that have housing to protect them from cold, rain, weather, so on and so forth, that an indoor monitor would not need. So that brings us to this really important piece, the data provider. How do we get all this data connected? Now, as I started before in this whole sort of presentation about the importance of data and data quality, it is a fundamental building block for everything else. In terms of reset, that is a lot of data. You have multiple sensors and devices all detecting their respective pollutants. You have intervals that are sometimes as frequent as a few seconds collecting this continuously for 24 seven. And you have multiple devices deployed in a project, in a room, in a building, and then potentially multiple buildings across a portfolio around the world. Tons of data. You need to have somebody who is capable of handling that data. And we also have to talk about this data intelligibility, data loss. If we lose too much data, we cannot understand it. So the standards also have to talk about what is the acceptable amount of data that's required so that it can be considered representative of what it is we're trying to analyze. 
So the reset standard also codifies and outlines how all the data is collected, and we use third-party platforms called accredited data providers to do this. Now, the next slide shows just a couple of our data providers that are on the website. We also have data, mo uh, excuse me, uh, monitors on the website, so devices on the website as well, and the links are there for your use. And here's just an example of a dashboard of one of those data providers. So you can choose which one is gonna best befit your project. There's lots of different dashboards that are out there that are very user-friendly. And the overall picture of what the ecosystem looks like. Thanks, Christine. So the overall picture of what this ecosystem looks like. Okay, so at the bottom, you have your accredited monitors, they're installed according to standard and they're collecting all of that data. That second tier is you have your accredited data providers that are aggregating that data for you. And then it's pushing that to the reset assessment cloud where you can cut into that data how you wish. And it's looking at both the data quantity as well as your performance. Now, what's really great in this next slide, we're talking about having two-way communications between the reset cloud and our accredited data providers that can then build off of building management systems so that they can speak to each other and have really efficient ways of controlling your buildings. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about budgeting. There are hard and soft costs when it comes to deploying and maintaining monitors for an air quality program. And we're talking about not just the cost of devices and the cost of deployment and the cost of maintenance, but there's also more to that, the triple bottom line and ROI. Now we're gonna talk most of this subject in part two of this series. So I encourage all of you to sign in for that. But we also are benefiting from having Christine from M. Moser here to walk us through a couple of case studies that talk about the ROI from personal experience. So Christine, thanks, I will hand it off to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I guess we'll just get straight into the case study. And thanks, Anjanette, for a lot of information. So all of you listening, I'm sure you may have some follow-up questions, and we will have time for that with Stanton coming up. We have a whole series coming up next week where we'll go through multiple examples and multiple iterations of how we implement IAQ monitoring, how that data really helps us provide healthy environments for people. But today we're just going to give a taste of that with one example, our New York City office, and we'll share a few stories there of how it's really helped the users. So here you can see this is a, a quick plan, an image, and really focusing on what has this IAQ done for us, you know, supporting our flexibility in the space, helping us with our ROI, future-proofing the space, and really empowering the occupants and guests. So this is what one of those dashboards that Anjanette mentioned would look like. And we have the five parameters that we can check 24 seven. And we actually loved measuring the space before we even moved in. We measured the space through construction so that on day one, we already had what we call 100% compliance, meeting the reset standard and that international benchmark for healthy air. So there was no, need to worry or off gas, nothing was happening. We knew exactly what was going on with our air. That gives people a lot of confidence, particularly now. And we'll talk a little bit more about what these, these graphs mean, but if you can look at them, you can see there's a dashed line that relates to the standard, and then there is a line that shows you what's going on in our space, where the numbers are, and the areas that are grayed out are non-working times. So we've tried to use the information and the data to cut it out so we really understand what is the quality of the air when people are in the space. But we watch it all of the time so that we can see trends and understand how it's improving the space. So for example, one element, if we go back, you can see here we found in the summary that the humidity was at about 23, 24% relative humidity. That's a little bit low, it's a little bit dry. And was, as one of the things that was mentioned earlier, when the humidity is dry, we can be more prone to illness and it can minimize our skin health and beyond. So immediately we saw that and we took some action. So here was the relative humidity down in the 20s. 
immediately you can see this is a series of days we got some humidifiers very simple solution and brought that to a health promoting range above 30 to 35 percent of course in the summer we have much higher rates this is something that you need to watch seasonally you need to watch daily and just be aware what's happening with the air quality uh, and just keep it as part of what you're what you're understanding about your space and the other aspect that we found is understanding what's the quality of the air outside. And you did see some of the monitors that Anginet shared for outdoor air quality. And there are many throughout New York and throughout many cities around the world that will tell you the quality of air outside. If you understand that, then you'll know, is it a good day to open the window or not? What's the humidity like? What's the PM 2.5 level like? What's the temperature like? So when those levels are, are great, so here you can see this was we had lifted up the humidity to 32%. We were quite happy and we've optimized. And indoor and outside were actually optimized at this point. And why is that important? Because we have operable windows. And as you can see, these are just some images of the space with the orange bubbles, but all of these windows are happily open. They're not locked if you don't want to. You can open them when you want, but we follow the recommendation and it's shared on a big screen. Everybody can see what's the day like. Is it a good day to open up? Additionally, we've augmented, and you can see the green background, but we've augmented our space with every decision we've made. What materials, what might off gas, what kinds of green walls we have. And these are certain green walls that are another tool in improving the IAQ. And we watch and we have data from these walls about how much oxygen they're actually promoting in our space. And this is how they work. They're the Nava systems. If, you're, if you know them, they bring in the air below. It comes out above going through the roots of the plants and really uh, in freshening the space. But also it's part of our versatility. So you can see those walls used to be together. Now they're separated. They move around. And another way that the IAQ is critical is a foundational element. Right now when you look into a space, people are looking for spaces that will give them a certain quality of air. The reset standard tells you what that benchmark is internationally, and when you can prove that you're meeting it, you can then move things around. There aren't certain areas that are healthy or not healthy. You can move things anywhere you want. So we had much more density pre-COVID. During COVID, we've actually minimized things, moved them around, and still had that very healthy air. We even moved them further, and we've actually turned them into spaces where we could create very active environments. And how can you get people to be active in an environment is you give them confidence about the quality of air that they're going to be breathing deeply into their lungs. And when you have that confidence, you can be on the trampoline, you can be actively working, you can be speaking with energy and gestures, and you know that your air is, is healthy and you can monitor that. Christine, can I ask a question? Um, oh, for sorry. our audience, where we have facility managers, architects like yourself, um, and other people in real estate, the measures that you're talking about with Reset, how does it impact the facility itself and also um, the company's return on investment for, for this entire program? Thank you for the question. Absolutely. And in fact, we're going to get into a lot more granular detail with that in our next uh, part two of this webinar series, but I, I do have a couple of, the, of slides that might help. One way is simply through specification and understanding the awareness of the materials that are specified in terms of construction, in terms of interior use, even things that are stored, cleaning equipment, how you operate for events, so it's management, it's operations, all of the things that we do when we're taking care of buildings and creating spaces are essential because as Anjanette mentioned at the very beginning of this discussion, the reset standard is performance-based. And no matter what's going on and what you're measuring, it's what you bring into the space that really will, will have a very big impact. So facility managers, users, designers have a big impact on what that space can be. The next you thing that we... Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something um, earlier in our discussions that I thought was really fascinating. And one is, is the level of the air quality after a cleaning crew has come through. <laughs> yes. Can you discuss that a little bit? 
Absolutely. And we'll share some exact um, examples of that with some of the programs we have coming up. But you can see directly the impact of any cleaning in the monitoring. And if we have people coming in and spraying things that have high VOCs to protect us from COVID or from other situations, we really want to be aware of what's in those cleaning products because they become part of our air. And one, one thing we can do is see what those two VOCs become. And if there's a pattern, we can very quickly identify what's going on on that day, speak to people who are taking care of the space, understand it, vet that material, and mitigate that. And you can see the change the next day. It, it will, it's 100% and you'll see that drop and I can share some of that, those data with you as well. And this picture is, is right on that same line, which is IAQ monitoring. So not only is it important to have a sensor and to deploy them, uh, the reset gives us a best practice way to deploy sensors, but it's also important to have quarterly or annual full tests and, and assessments to really understand where are you as a benchmark with a, from a third party, because that gives you that additional confidence. and keeping those records and making sure that they're available to people and then making sure that you're calibrating your mon your sensors, I think annually is what we reach for, and keeping that record as well. So that people can have a lot of confidence that the data that you're sharing and the way that the space is being, facility is being maintained is truly meeting a best practice benchmark standard. And that's where Reset is also coming in and giving confidence back. This supports and builds trust in the space, and it does a lot of things that are really critical in today's market. And I think one other way would be, again, you know, for example, when we upgrade to take care of our, of our space, one of the first things that one does is, is see if you can add in a MERV 13 filter or above. Once you do that, that's basically taking the outdoor air that comes in, filtering it before it goes into your space. By setting this up, we actually immediately made sure that our air was at a higher standard. And in fact, we were the first unit within our building to have this upgrade done, which has now become something that many, many more people throughout the building and throughout many buildings are asking to have installed. But we already had it done. So when things came up and new protocols came available, there was no cost. We were already at that high level of 100% great air. And this uh, has given a lot of confidence. And so maintaining these records, maintaining these high values is actually saving you time, money, and anxiety over the future. And then making decisions really quickly, trying to make changes later in the game is always a more expensive and more challenging opportunity. So there's a, yeah. Uh, and finally, I'll just share, these were some pictures of, again, you can see what's going on with the space. And it's, uh, the top one is very important, PM 2.5, and that really needs to stay under 15. And you can see here, we've got a, you know, immeasurable at somewhere one, one to two, which is great. That means that things that are coming off and the debris that is coming off of the chairs and the tables and so forth is very minimal, and that we're recirculating and cleaning that air very well. And so what we're taking in is pure air. You have also can see that the TVOCs are down under the 500 mark, which means that whatever is in the air, the total volatile organic compounds are minimal. And uh, you, you have no worries with that. And then CO2, again, that's a really interesting marker for how many people are in a space, how well your brain is working if you're in a conference room. And keeping those levels low is also very, very important. And we're, we're learning more about that, particularly with our current aerosol uh, pandemic. So this is, this is a, a really important way to keep that data. And these, these screens are available, open. People can see them at all times. And they're not always at 100, but they have been. And if they go down or if you see slight changes, you can quickly figure out what's going on and keep it at a high standard. So it's a really important process. Wonderful. Yeah. So, Christine, or Christine George, um, what's the first thing that uh, either a building owner or a tenant to facilities team would do to find out what their indoor air quality actually is, like a benchmark? What is that first step like? 
George, is that for you? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I, I can take a first pass and then Christine, if you have something to add. Um, so, uh, Anjanet earlier talked about the video camera versus a snapshot, right? Um, and so you can first take that snapshot just to understand uh, where you are at. And we've seen some clients doing this even before the pandemic where they were doing sort of annual testing. You can have a third party IAQ uh, you know, consultant or, or contractor come in, go through your building and take representative air samples um, and, and kind of give you a report. So that's a snapshot in time, but as a really low cost, easy to do, there's no hardware involved because that IQ tester brings everything they need with them. It's sort of part of their pricing. Um, that can give you a great first step is have them come, you know, during regular operating hours, that's key. Um, you know, while people are there, or maybe not as many people are there right now, but you know, while the space is running as, as it's going to right now, um, and having them do a snapshot for many of these metrics, VOCs, PM 2.5. That's a that's a you know a, a low bar. Another low bar is even getting just one monitor, just a single monitor, and placing it centrally. You know, if you have an open office area, placing it on a column or a wall, again away from the windows, away from the diffusers, just to get a sense of where even the general area is at uh, mm -hmm. from a continuous basis. Um, you don't even have to go to the scale of uh, getting a commercial grade. You can start with one you can purchase online yourself. There's a very, very low bar to, to sort of get into this. And then as you want more refined data, you start to want to run your building based on that data, then the quality of that data begins to, to matter. And that's when you want to look for reset accredited monitors and kind of go through that process. So that first step, though, is it an engineering firm that they would reach out to? Is there a separate, is it ASHRAE? Are they looking for, how, if I were the building owner and I'm just, I mean, is it Googling to find out who these people are? <laughs> or can I get in touch with an engineer and they can suggest somebody who can come in and suggest, a, you know, a spec for the, the, the monitor that you can get online? I mean, is it, is it that easy or, or is it more complicated than that? No, it is. It is that easy. As far as buying a monitor, um, you know, definitely feel free to reach out to anybody here, uh, myself. Uh, the Reset website itself, even if you don't go for the certification, there's a list of manufacturers and products. So it's as simple as choosing one of those. Um, you know, uh, to give you an example, Aware and Kaitera, I know, have Reset accredited monitors. They're available in New York. We've seen projects uh, using them. So. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, as far as the testing goes, most environmental consultants uh, and some engineering firms uh, do that sort of testing. So um, it might be Googling, but it's likely a building manager already has an environmental consultant uh, for other things that they have been doing. Um, so that would be a great first step. Gotcha. I, I would agree that it's really important. This monitor that we're sharing here, it's important to to get that point in time measurement, but to really get that continuous measurement as we were talking about and to look at it and to try to understand exactly where do you stand on these various parameters um, and to dust it in different areas and see what's going on. Do you have leakage in, in terms of the building environment itself? Do you have areas, copy machine areas or printing or different zones which are creating their own challenges? Do you have the ability to to understand your space and, and imagine how is that air moving through this space uh, and just really thinking how can you make it healthy so then once you do that of course you're going to go and see how the building's running what's the HVAC system how is how is the filtration you're going to want to see is there any filtration and if there are what is it and is it being maintained and would they be willing to share the schedule of how that's being changed and sometimes it's that simple that we're actually going in particularly as we've done here and in other places and saying you know we know you guys have are taking care of your building in a certain way can we make sure that the, these filters that are taking care of this space are changed or, or cleaned or looked at every three months and can we mm -hmm. have a copy can we take a photograph of that would you mind 
we need that for our records so that we may not need to buy a new filter every three months but at least we know it's been looked at the coils have been checked there's no mold you know these are part of the reset standard the well standard and and just part of good practice so we're we're implementing that in a lot of our in a lot of the work understood so just in a in a technical kind of way i mean if you're a tenant that really is interested in in this and um and understands the importance of good indoor air quality for the occupants um for for lots of reasons that you spoke about uh and you decided to to go um with this with reset uh and i i see that there's a lot of or not a lot but there's a decent amount of equipment that's on the roof and let's say your landlord is maybe not completely on board with this. Can you do this completely separate from your landlord, even though you're going to be accessing some of their equipment? So you've got a few questions mixed in there and probably not. Sorry. Not <laughs> us and George. But can you clear your air if you can't control that space? Of course you can. There are standalone filtration units that can be on the ground, on the ceilings, throughout. There's things you can put in the windows depending on what your ventilation, your exhaust programs are. You can really try to understand your space and you can absolutely make a difference in it. If you can work with the building, you know, obviously that's much better. And when we're designing the building, if we can get the whole core and shell of the building itself to serve all tenants that way, that's our ideal. And sure. one thing, and I, I think Anjanette, uh, she did a fantastic job and covered it, but it was a lot of information in a very uh, quick, quick pace. And Christine, I think there was actually one slide that may have been hidden um, accidentally, but uh, to answer Jessica, your question about if I'm a tenant, do I need to get the landlord's sort of involvement or sign in to do the reset certification? And the answer is no. There are two two separate certifications, right? Um, you need, might need some information, but you don't need them to necessarily make uh, changes to their equipment. As Christine said, if you put in a monitor and your air quality isn't where it needs to be for certification, or even just for your own, uh, you know, you set your own thresholds for performance, you can clean your air locally. So even if the air coming out from the base building might not be the best um, or there's not enough outside air let's say there are you can buy a standalone HEPA filter they can go in the ceiling um, these sorts of things I'll also talk about in in part two uh, mm -hmm. you know more specifically but there are ways that the, the tenant can control that so there's a there's a reset commercial interiors sort of certification and then there's a base building certification if you want to think of it that way and they're complementary so a tenant even if the base building doesn't have outside air monitors on their ventilation system, on their DOAS air handler, whatever that's providing the outside air, the tenants can still on their own go install the wall mounted sensors, monitor their uh, their air for three months. And if all the, the metrics are under the reset thresholds, you know they're achieving high performance, they can get a certification for just their space. And that has nothing to, you know, they didn't need to go ask the, the base building to go install anything extra. Excellent. Yeah, because I think that there's going to be, um, you know, uh, members of FMO or facility managers and operators in general that may not get a sign on, you know, for their from their landlord and that they do want to do this because of the benefits. And so that's nice to know that it's not it's not something that you absolutely have to link into a, a building system. It can stand on its own. Absolutely, yeah. These dashboards, you know, the the sensors just connect to a Wi-Fi, or even a cellular network. If you have network security concerns, they can be even off your your Wi-Fi. And there's just a dashboard you log in online, or they have an app uh, in many cases, so you don't have to interlink with the BMS or anything like that. So at a tenant level, uh, there's a lot that can be done, a lot of visibility, and you could start again with just that one, get one reset sensor install it in centrally in your space and use that as a starting point. Um, mm -hmm. But I do agree that that continuous monitoring reveals very different things. Um, you know, it's the equivalent of being in the hospital and having your heart monitor on versus going in for a checkup once a year. You know, you were, you know, you're healthy six months ago. How are you doing now? It's hard to tell. That's a good analogy, actually. Yeah, that's very relatable. Um, 
Okay. I'm um, just trying to think of some questions that I have because I'm always very curious about these things. Um, I definitely see the benefits uh, with people coming back to work or come, not coming back to work, my apologies, coming back to the office. We're all working from home. Um, but uh, the, the knowledge that you're walking into a space that's being continually monitored for lots of things for the, the, the uh, indoor air quality and for particulates, um, are you able to measure uh, humidity and things like that in the space? You can do that, can't you? Absolutely, and in so, fact, that's, that's what's been you know, one of the elements, understanding the temperature and humidity uh, beyond as well as the CO2. And you saw that that recess has a new method to give you some idea of risk in terms of mm -hmm. transmission. These items are really important to, to, to keep in mind. And that's one of the reasons that we took that effort to make sure that our humidity was, was within a parameter that we felt more comfortable with. And we continue to watch it. And many parts of the world we're actually looking to reduce that because mm -hmm. again as, as Anjanette mentioned sometimes that may you know cause other things to happen and, and, and certainly can affect mold or if you have any uh, unhealthy materials it could cause them to off gas more mm -hmm. ideally you get to specify healthy materials and that's not enough that's not a problem and I'll also add that it gives you kind of even without any interaction with the landlord, right, from a tenant perspective, it gives you some insight into how the building is being operated. Um, so I can give a, you know, a specific example I've seen where um, you have some confidence, for example, PM 2.5. If you watch it over time, when people leave the office, it trickles up. And when the people are in the office, it trickles down. That speaks to the filtration. A, there's filtration in the building. Um, and B, it's actually working because you can see that the PM 2.5 that had built up overnight because maybe they turned it back or turned it off, mm -hmm. uh, went back down to zero. Um, you can also get a sense that you're getting some outside air, uh, particularly on a, you know, I've seen recently we have one monitor, you know, if it's raining outside and you see your humidity jump up versus a day where it wasn't, now you get some idea that, okay, some of the outside air is making it into my, into my office. You start to get it, a little, you know, stronger sense of comfort that, okay, I'm getting ventilation, I'm getting filtration. But again, if those levels aren't where you'd like them to be, then that you can take into your own hands um, as a tenant and then push those levels. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can ask uh, Stanton, are you able to unmute yourself and join us? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, just think maybe you've been listening to the conversation. If you have some insights you'd like to share on any of this. Um, I think, I think for me recently, it's, it's been quite interesting. So the reason we did, we, um, we started doing reset air was because, um, air quality is something that's relatively invisible and, um, our, our team is currently based in Shanghai. And so China has always had an air quality issue from, uh, from outdoors, uh, with COVID and how, um, COVID particles are transmitted through aerosol in the air, it's kind of brought to light that um, air quality is something that you don't notice, you can't see, but it affects us. Um, just a very basic example would be um, with, with this, is, this is an analogy, with uh, meditation, the first thing you practice is um, how to breathe. And uh, it's because we don't think about it. So air quality is something we barely ever think about. I think the most value that this is bringing is that it makes people more aware of air in general. I love that you just made that example because we do need to breathe more, but it, you know, one of the examples I shared was users can breathe with enjoyment and without worry when they can see that that air quality is excellent. And one of the projects that I'll be able to share with you all next week is actually a meditation center where that was very part, much part of it, where you come in and you immediately know, not only are you in you know, a beautiful environment that's peaceful and brings your parasympathetic nervous system to its levels, but you can see right away the air quality is phenomenal and you can close your eyes and breathe deeply. And so that's a very important element um, in, in, in any workplace, in any home, but certainly if you're in concentration on breath.
So that's a great example. Thanks, Dan. I want I wanted to put out also to to our audience, as I know we have a bit of time left. Um, we kind of jumped very quickly into the sort of case studies and the benefits, um, and ran through sort of the drier pieces of kind of the steps of the certification itself, um, and and the benefits of that rather quickly. So if anybody has any questions about the actual certification um, and then and the steps that are involved there um, you know please feel free to throw them in the chat and I think we have a um, a few people have dropped off so if also if you feel comfortable to unmute um, I think at this point we have a small enough group that that would be fine as well if you have any questions I have a weird specific question because is I'm constantly curious and you might this may be a perfect example for you know question for you guys um after an FM has built out new office space and I know it's the question the answer to this is that it may be very variable but imagining that that the interior design firm has used low VOC materials as much as they could um, it may not be lead, but they've really been responsible in terms of the materials that they've specified and the product that's been installed in the space. About how long do you think it takes for those VOCs to off gas enough that you feel comfortable with people coming in to the space? Is it just a week? Is it is it more than that? I know that that this um, these monitors that you have would absolutely identify the most op optimum time for people to reoccupy, but do you have sort of a an average number of days or? Uh, maybe other people have an answer to this, but I believe this is coming from an age old time when paint going on wet took a certain amount of time to dry and once dry, the VOCs were captured within it and don't come back out again. And so that was a sense of this is how long it takes to stop that odor and uh, we now know you know those toxins but what we also now know is that is not true of almost any other element that we specify a sealant for the concrete an adhesive behind a material will generously off gas for a decade so there is no quick one week, one month, it'll be fine later. That is why it's critical to measure and understand the specificity of every material, whether or not you're going for certification. It's critical that we take responsibility for every material, every glue, every adhesive that we put into a space. And we take that very, very seriously. There is mindful materials. There are multiple ways to understand those materials and many material suppliers spend quite a bit of time to share that information. But again, it's on us taking care of that space, designing that space to make sure it doesn't off gas. And, um, you know, there are remediations if it is, and that can be found out if you find that you've measured your space and it's, it's not meeting the standard you wish it to meet. But the best thing and the, the best thing for the planet, the best thing for people is to specify, you know, good materials that are healthy. So it's really important. And just to add to the, the time factor. So um, earlier we were discussing how a f just a flush out is not an effective strategy. A hundred percent agreement with that. It's not to say you shouldn't still do a flush out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's still definitely helpful. Um, and you can, uh, I think there's lead credits that give you cal basically a time a time metric for for a calculation but it's usually you know depending on how big of your air system it could be hours to maybe even an entire day for the flush out now in terms of how long do i wait before the space is safe as christine pointed out everything is off gassing uh but i will point out not to scare people that you're in a cloud of chemicals uh, <laughs> constantly is that that hvac system is also running continuously in your building so if you have Maybe you have carbon filters, probably not, but even a MERV filter and particularly outside air, that dilution um, is, is the key there. So even if everything is off gassing, if our ventilation system is providing adequate outside air and running at the same time, we're balancing those, those two things out. So you wanna select low VOC products so that you're not fighting 
you know, a massive level of off gassing. Um, but it's possible to balance that where you you don't have to be concerned when you're in the space because all those VOCs you're throwing outside air at it and it's diluting it to a, a safe level. Gotcha. Okay. I, I, sorry, I had a quick question for Christine if we've got an extra minute. Um, you mentioned that you monitored the indoor air quality of the space during construction. I wonder like what nuggets were there um, during that time, like when drywall was going in, when when the paint was going on, like were there Yeah, ways? it was actually really fun to to really stay cognizant with the construction team as we're designing and building and see okay what's going on today we're you know we're literally there's some sawing of pipes there's going to be particulate matter uh, but how quickly did it disappear what was happening what's the process you know of course the spaces are being ventilated people are using their secure safety masks how is that working because you're really looking at that time for the health of the of the work the working people that are creating the space and then to see how quickly it will go back and always seeing if there are any actual toxins you know dust is dust and it comes from everything that you're cutting of course with wood with with laying things down but when you see any toxin does that never you you really shouldn't and I, I there are different projects where you can find that things will happen somebody might pick the wrong paint or somebody might be doing something out in the elevator lobby zone simultaneous that's not something that you got to specify and you can figure it out instantly and make it stop just you have facts in front of you and you can say this is what's going on whatever you're doing let's just give it a pause let's figure out what we need to do and let's make sure we go forward in a healthy way and it's not about um, a legal situation it's just purely the risk control of let's create the most healthy space we can and so it is very interesting I remember when we first moved into our Hong Kong space there was a ceremony you know that had incense and had some energy to it and you know it was exciting on the monitors <laughs> there was plenty of you know spiking but what was amazing was it went right back down to a perfect metric within that hour because the system was designed to let fresh air in and to take care of it. So that gives you another type of confidence that, you know, if somebody comes in and sprays perfume or does whatever they choose to do in that space, if you've designed it properly, it will take care of itself. What we're trying to avoid is a continuous off-gassing solution that would come from something that's within the space and that that can be specified out so yeah thank you yeah thank you for the question so we're coming down to the end of the hour uh we do have a couple of questions that are left we there's one in particular that i thought was excellent um if people have stanton if you have a few minutes to answer this i i'd like for the audience to know what this is. So this is from um, a facility manager. Um, if I understood correctly, you share the dashboard in a common space so all your staff can view the current indoor air quality. Can you talk a little more about this? Did you need to educate your staff on what the numbers mean? Is this required as part of the standard? Okay, so um, the, the standard states that all occupants in the space need to have access to the data. So our recommendation typically is to have a screen displayed somewhere so that people can be exposed to the data more. Um, but th it's also a possibility where you make it so that it's accessible via an app uh, that people can sign on to or visit um, to see the data. So it's not always in your face. There's um, one thing that a lot of people ask is what if the data is bad, right? So um, our recommendation typically is you want to start monitoring first and then have your leadership team know about the situation and make all the changes necessary beforehand. The second thing that we do um, for the standard is that we require you to measure everything and then compile them into 30 minute averages. And this um, removes the possibility of freaking out people where there's a sudden spike where the number shoots up to um, some ridiculous number because when you're looking at the screen, it's not always showing you the graph, depending on which dashboard you're using. So sometimes it's just a number that's displayed. Um, 30 minute averages rounds it out significantly. So it doesn't jump up, uh, doesn't show a, a ridiculous number. And um, 
from what we've seen, a lot of people will start asking about the information. Um, so uh, having a little pamphlet or something that gets sent out in a newsletter to your office is a good way to approach it. Um, and there's, there's also monitors now coming out that are just focused on formaldehyde. We're a bit more afraid of that right now because formaldehyde sensors aren't very good at detecting only formaldehyde. They're very accurate in a lab setting, but they're still not quite strong enough for um, in a setting where it's there's a lot of other potential VOCs. So um, having VOC data be displayed there makes it easier for people to uh, basically well, for, for the management team to basically explain that this is a view, this is total volatile organic compounds. We have to figure out exactly what's in there. It could be just alcohol. So Friday afternoons typically have high VOC numbers because a lot of offices have um, happy hour. But, uh, but it's just, you know, like it's, there is a little bit of understanding in um, what the data means and that uh, we shouldn't use, the data is about to, is supposed to bring awareness rather than uh, provide fear. Right. That's a good answer. Okay. Good question too, actually. Okay. Well, it's two minutes after noon. We have another fantastic reset event um, on March 4th, same time, 11 to 12 uh, in the morning, in the afternoon. Um, and that is, is where Christine and George, um, you guys are going to dive more into actual case studies. So, so real project profiles and um, nitty gritty stuff that I think, uh, you know, our facility managers will be very interested in. Um, there's nothing like, you know, real life story to kind of uh, put a, a roundness to all of this data and information. So anyway, I want to thank you very, very much for being on our panel. This was great. Um, my co-chair Liz Vasek from Ford Foundation will moderate the second event. And uh, yep. And then our sponsors. We want to just say thank you so much for for being part of IFMA NYC. I think that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. It. Take care. You. Bye. Great day.